One important application of magnetic fields is the magnetic field due to a current carrying loop. A loop is circular in shape and it has a negligible thickness. So we often conceptualize it as being infinitely thin. The magnetic field due to a loop is shown in the images here. The loop will make magnetic field lines that cut right through the center and create a nearly uniform magnetic field in that region. The formula below is for the magnetic field due to a loop. And so let's use this formula here Interestingly though, this magnetic field doesn't have to be found at the center of the loop. It could be along a central axis of that loop. So let's imagine we've got an infinitely thin ring here. And the ring has a radius called big R. And this axis, I'll call the x-axis, cuts right through the center of that loop. Now we could find the magnetic field at the center, but this formula is actually a little bit more versatile than that even. It would let us find the magnetic field at any point along this axis. So the distance from the center to the point where we're evaluating the field is called x in this formula. Big R stands for the radius of the loop. I is the current in the loop, of course, and mu naught is the permeability. Now, if we want to use this very versatile formula to find the magnetic field strength at the center of the loop, then we can do that. All we have to do is just let x be zero. Right now, x is a positive number. So here we would be trying to find the field at a point located far from the loop. But if we let x equal 0, can we simplify this formula a little bit? And we'll find the magnetic field at the center of a current carrying loop. The numerator is all going to stay the same, but we're going to put in r squared plus 0 squared, and then raise that to the 3 halves. If we raise r squared to the 3 halves, then by the rules of exponents here, the 2's will cancel. And that'll give us just r cubed in the denominator. Now we can cancel the two r's above with two of the r's below. And then we'll finally get our formula. It comes out to a nice, concise formula. And this is for the magnetic field at the center of a current carrying loop. Now what direction is the field in a situation like that? All right, so I'm going to try to draw the loop in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to try to show some 
of the 3D nature of the wire. Okay, now if we want to find the direction of the magnetic field at the center, then first we have to know what direction current is flowing in our loop. Let's just say that our current is flowing counterclockwise at this time. then we have to figure out what the direction of the magnetic field will be at this point, which I'll call point P. We have a formula for the strength of it, but we want to use right-hand rules in order to determine the direction. So in order to do this, you have to imagine grabbing hold of the wire just like we did with straight wires. And your thumb has to go in the direction of current. All right, so let's just try that real quick. I'm going to draw as best I can a person's thumb. Their thumb has to point in the direction of current. And then they need to reach around here and grab hold of the wire with their fingertips. All right, so if we look at what kind of magnetic field is created around this segment of wire, what we would see is we would see X's on this side of the wire. This is where the fingers are going into the page, so to speak. And then here on the other side, we see that the fingers are pointing out of the loop. And so what kind of magnetic field is that? That would be represented as dots. Okay. Now we want to try that same phenomenon at a different portion of the loop and see what happens. So let's try it here. This will be the thumb. And they need to grab hold of the wire with their right hand, wrapping the fingers around the wire. Okay, so we're going to have fingers going around the loop into the page, so to speak, on this side of the wire. But in the middle, we see that the fingers are protruding through it toward us. It turns out that no matter where you grab this loop with your right hand, we're always going to see that we have X's on the outside of the loop. and dots on the inside. So the actual magnetic field created at point P will point out. Perpendicularly to the plane of the loop. That will be the magnetic field that we're talking about. Now we can represent this in two dimensions. If we just lay a loop flat on the plane, uh, 
Okay, now we don't care about showing the three-dimensional nature of the loop right now. Uh, but we, what we will do is show the direction of current in the loop. And never mind what's causing the current at this time. Let's just assume that there is current there for some reason. We'll get more into that later. But if this were the case, and somebody were to grab hold of the loop with their right hand, what we would see is that their fingers would always protrude through the center of the loop in all points, no matter where they grabbed that loop. And their fingers would go into the page anywhere around the loop. So a current carrying loop really can create a substantially uniform magnetic field in its center. That field right now would be pointing out toward us as shown in the three-dimensional version on the right. Now how could this formula be modified to work for loops containing more turns of wire? Well, as we saw in previous examples, magnetic field obeys the principle of superposition. So if each of these loops, let's say, carries a current I, then their contributions to the magnetic field will actually be additive. So whereas we would have this much contribution to the field due to one of them, we would have the same contribution due to the other loop, and we would have another contribution from the third loop. So this idea can actually be simplified uh, into this formula, where the B of a loop will be N times mu I over 2R, where N stands for the number of loops or number of turns. In this case, N would be 3. So N is the number of turns. Our other formula can also be modified in a similar way. All we have to do is just put an N in front of it. But now we want to point out the difference between an infinitely thin loop and what is called a solenoid. The formula that was given here is actually for infinitely thin loops that are all located in the same position. Even though I drew a little bit of spacing between these loops, I just did that so that we could clearly see how many loops there were. But in reality, for this formula to be valid, we would have to have those loops basically right on top of each other, like that. So that there was no width to the thing. But here, in a solenoid, we actually do have a significant length to our object, and that's given the letter L. The magnetic field inside a solenoid is reasonably uniform. And we also find that the magnetic field lines created by a solenoid will be similar to those of a bar magnet. So that's an interesting property that solenoids have, and it just demonstrates that close connection between electricity and magnetism. As the length of the solenoid increases, we find that the interior field becomes more and more uniform. Not only that, but the exterior magnetic field also becomes weaker. Of course, the field strength inside will be proportional to the number of turns in the solenoid, so the more turns you have, the stronger the magnetic field you can create.
An ideal solenoid is approached when the turns are closely spaced and the length is much greater than the radius of the turns. For an ideal solenoid, we'll treat the exterior field as if it were negligible, almost zero, and we'll treat the interior field as if it's uniform. When we do, we can use this formula for the magnetic field due to a solenoid. When we do, we can use this formula for the magnetic field inside a solenoid. The formula says that the B inside our solenoid is given by the permeability constant times the number of turns times the current carried by the solenoid. It'll generally have the same current in all the loops. And then we'll divide by the length of that solenoid. Note that the length never played a part in the magnetic field due to a loop because that loop is supposed to have a length of zero. It's supposed to be infinitely thin. So that's just the difference between the two formulas and when they're used.